Okay, Rabbi Sai. So uh, we were talking last week about the merchant of Venice. And the issue was that we were talking about uh, can you sell can you sell your uh, kidney or not? Right? Here's a lemonade stand, and right next to that someone has a kidney stand. You know? Selling my kidney. Is that is that sale um, is that is that a viable sale? If you make a contract, could anyone break the contract? That was the question. And we said basically it all depended on whether you own your body or not. Are you considered the owner of your corporeal body, right? If you're the owner of your body, so you can sell it. Why not? You own it. You can sell your car. You can sell your house. You can sell a part of your body. If you're not the owner, so you can't sell it. So you can make a contract. You can do whatever you want. It's meaningless. It's just meaningless. It's, uh, it's excised in uh, futility because you don't own it. So you can't sell it. So we said that it's the machloik is between the Mishchus Chinuch and Rabbi Zevin. We said that the Minchis Chinuch holds that even though there's a lav, if anyone hits someone, there's a lav of the Torah called uh, Pen Yosef. If he hits someone, there's a lav of the Torah called Pen Yosef. But the Minchis Chinuch says, if B says to A, hit me, A could hit him. A could hit him, and A won't get the lav. Why? Because it says it's your body. You want someone to hit you. So you could basically uh, get rid of the love because you own your own body. Right? We also said according to uh, the Michal Chinuch, right? It, it reminds me of a joke. What happens when the uh, masochist marries the sadist? So the masochist, masochist says, hit me, hit me! And the sadist says, no! Okay? So, so, be as it may, according to the Michal Chinuch, you own your body. And therefore, you can let someone hit you. If you give permission, no problem, there's no lav. You get rid of the lav. Also, the Mikhat Chinuch said that if someone's trying to commit suicide, you don't got to save him. In principle, someone's trying to commit suicide, you do not have to save him. Why? Because the Gemara equates saving someone's money and saving someone's life. We saw that Gemara inside last week. At the same passage that tells you that you gotta save someone's money, you gotta save someone's life. And we know what's the law by saving someone's money. The Raman brings down, If let's say Yaakov just is throwing away his money, he just throws it down the street, or he's totally careless with it, you don't gotta try to save it for him. Someone leaves his cow in a barn without a door and without being roped and then, the, and then surprisingly the cow runs away so, yeah, so Yaakov uh, just basically abandons his cow in the barn without without the uh, rope without locking the door you don't got to save it and the round picks out and the round brings another case you throw your wild in the street whatever you throw your wild in the street you don't got to save it you don't got to try to return to him and the round points, points out it's not that you are masquerade it's a very important point you were not mafia. It wasn't like you said, okay, anyone could take my cow. Or you said, okay, anyone could take my uh, wallet. Because that would be simple, that you don't got to save it. Because it's not his. No, it's not talking about that you gave up ownership. You didn't give up ownership. But since you were so negligent, uh, and basically you showed that you don't really care too much about this, so therefore, there is no mitzvah to Shabbat Zedah. And I'm sad. But You can't steal the cow. The cow is not can't be stolen and you can't steal the wallet because the original owner did not give up ownership but since the original, original owner so that he doesn't care about it and is so negligent about it you don't got to save it right so the Mikhil Chinuch says the same exact thing applies to a person's body if a guy again because the Gemara equates the two the Gemara equates saving someone else's money Hashem Zaveda like next time we're going to learn Elam and that's the first Gemara we learn Elam is this, is this Rambam and the uh and, and the Gemara equates it to an Edwin saving someone's life. So just like by Hashem Savedo, if the guy doesn't care about his stuff, you don't got to save him. Also, when committing suicide, 
you don't got to save him because he's he's got to care about his stuff. I mean, he's trying to kill himself, obviously. He's he's he, he's negligible. He's negligent about his own body. Okay, on that. That's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. Right. Exploit your thought. That's why you're the cameraman. Right. That's exactly the point. According to the Mishnah's Chinna, the body is your stuff. That's exactly the point. And therefore, just like your stuff, you could create a situation where you're negligent. You, you're, you don't care about it. You're you're negligent about it. You could same. You could you could create exact same situation for your body. Right. I just I just want to make a, a very important uh, observation. It's, it's, it's obvious what I'm saying here. There, when we talk about suicide, there are people who are, are, are totally faultless. They have a chemical imbalance, or they're really going through I don't know some type of horrendous situation. I'm not talking about that type of suicide. That that guy is that has no control. That's not what the Michas Chinuch is talking about. That you don't save a guy who's trying to do suicide. That person is like almost like a shaitan per se. He he's doing something without. With, and it's considered that he's doing his own, his kid is doing it with, uh, without volition. We're not talking about that type of suicide. We're talking about a suicide, never sometimes like a rich man also loses his money. Or sometimes you get these politicians or rabbis, God forbid, they get caught doing something wrong and they don't want to face reality. It's just easier for them to kill themselves. That, that, they're talking about that type of suicide. Because that type of suicide, again, I'm not, a, I'm not judging anyone, but that type of suicide, you made a choice to do it. You weren't, it wasn't something wrong with you. you. You made an evaluation, I'd rather die than live. Okay, so that, that's the type of suicide we're talking about. We are not, many suicides, it's hard to ascertain exactly, but many suicides, for sure, it's not, it's not called the victim's fault. For, for halakhic reasons, most of the times, we, we assume that it's the first type of suicide, where the guy had absolutely no control. He had no control. It's not his fault. But there is definitely a genre of suicides that, the guy just decided he doesn't want to live anymore because he didn't want to face the music, whatever, whatever the situation was. Okay, fine. So, just realize what suicide we're talking about over here. Next. So, exactly like uh, Yonatan said, according to the if you own your body, you could sell it, and therefore you could tell someone to hit you, and therefore you could commit, if someone, if someone tries to commit suicide, you don't got to save them. Rabbi Zevin, on, on the other hand, and a whole slew of rabbis say, Mechizchinik, you don't, it's, it's totally, you're totally wrong. That's totally ridiculous. And exactly what Yonatan said, yeah, your money, you could decide you want to be neg negligent about it. That's, your, that, that's in your, uh, your jurisdiction. You could decide, I don't care about my cow. Again, I'm not mafker, but you know what? Whatever happens, happens. I don't care about my wallet. But you, but you don't own your body, coin to seven. And since you don't own your body, it belongs to God. You can't decide that you want to commit suicide. And if you do decide, it doesn't mean absolutely nothing. It has actually no halachic uh, uh, strength. And you can't decide that you don't, care, you, you don't care about your body and you're going to be negligent with it. And even if you do, it doesn't have any halachic uh, validity. Because it's, it's just ridiculous. You don't own your body. So Rabbi Zevin says that your equation between Ashava Saveda, when someone's uh, throwing away his wallet or cow, or someone's throwing away his body, is not a good equation. And therefore, Rabbi Zevin says, you can't sell someone to hit you. Even if you get some person to hit you, you're, the other guy's still over the love, right? And even if you try to commit suicide, someone has to, has to save, save you. Even to Michal Shabbos, you know someone's trying to commit suicide. You got to be Michal Shabbos to save him. Again, I'm talking about the second type of suicide. Even though the guy's in control of himself. He knows what he's doing. He's not, he doesn't have no chemical imbalance or whatever it is. He knows what he's doing. You got to save him on Shabbos. And therefore, as Evan said, if you sell your kidney, it doesn't mean anything because you can't sell your kidney. You can't uh, sell, right? Okay, so now, now, last year we brought a, 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 a bunch of different proofs back and forth to Reb Zevin, to the I want to continue a little bit about that, different proofs. So, we're going to start off with probably one of the most famous Gemaras and Shas that we all learn in kindergarten. It's like one of the first Gemaras they teach you. But what is that? The Gemara says in Yuma, and that's uh, 35b, right? In Lamed Hayon Bay, the Lord says in Yuma, there are three people who in the next world, when they come to God, they're going to say, Oh, Rebbein Shalom, I couldn't learn Torah. I'm blameless. Don't. No impugning me. I'm blameless. Who? The poor person, the rich person, and the Russia. And the Russia means a very handsome person. So God's going to say, sorry guys, no excuse because there were three people who were 
uh, poor, rich, and they were exceedingly handsome, and they managed to learn Torah. So you see, that's not an excuse. So the Gemara says, the honey comes to the honey comes to uh, after 120, and, and the Rebbeinu Shalom says to him, "Why did you learn some Torah? You couldn't learn a half an hour a day. Like, what's going on here? You couldn't do nothing." So the honey says, "Oh, you know, it's given day is schwer. Hanos is given day is schwer. I didn't have time to learn." Torah is lazy. What do you want from me, God? So God says back, "Really? Were you poor than Hillo? Were you poor than Hillo?" And what? Who's this? The famous Hillel Zaken, the first, right? Now, what does it say over there? Hillel Zaken would go to work. That's not like he went to work. Every day he would go to work, but he made a, 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 he made a, a pittance of a salary, right? What? Did he say he worked for Arsimeh? No, no, that wasn't his job. But he did make a pittance of a salary that he did do. What a salary? A, a small, small, small salary, and he says that. He made like a dollar, I'll say a dollar. He made a dollar a day, he gives a duffel lush and a tr- tr- tropic, tropic, I don't know exactly what it is. And he would take half of that and give it to, to feed his family. And half, he would use it to go to the base medrash to learn. Because there was a guard that used to guard the base medrash. There was a guard who used to guard the base medrash. And you had to pay to go in. Right? I guess it was, then you get free tuition like Arthur Mack. You had to pay to go in. <laughs> right? So they, 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 they talk about that. They talk about that, why was there a guard? Uh, a guard in Beit Medish? So some say that uh, at night there were um, unsavory people who would, ha- who would spend their nights in the, in, in the Beit Medish. Like last year we talked about, uh, we talked about hydras, we talked about demons. Anyway, they kept the guard there at night. And th- they had to pay the guard, right? To keep the unsavory people out. So they had to, everyone who came in had to give a little bit, a, 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 a 50 cents to the guard. And Hill didn't even have, uh, uh, okay, fine. The others say that the, the guard was the ones who also supplied the electricity and the oil, right? The oil for whatever, the electricity, but for the, for the oil lamp. So basically, the guard was really like the shamish, really. And he, so you weren't really paying so much for the guard, you're paying more for the upkeep of the shul, right? Right, makes sense. Uh, some say it was like, uh, if you know the famous Gemara in Brachis, Rabbi Gamaliel used to not allow everyone to come into base medrash. So you had to, they needed a guard to make sure that only the most um, dedicated or pure Tamidim, uh, only righteous Tamidim, whatever it is, there was a guard. That's what it was. You had to pay, right? Right, you know the famous joke? The guy goes uh, to reform shul, and, and he wants to, it's his high holy days, and the guy's running to get into the into reform shul. The guard stops him. No, did you buy a ticket? So the guy says, no, 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 I don't want to. I don't want to pray. My friend who's in the reform shul now, his wife is giving birth. I just got to tell him to come home to, to take his wife to the hospital. The guard said, no, 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 no. No ticket, you're not coming in. The guy says, are you crazy? <laughs> my, 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 I just want to don't tell my friend for one second just to come out. I don't want to, I, don't, I, I, I ain't even Jewish. I just want to come out. I just <laughs> want to get my friend to come take his wife to the hospital. Back and forth, the guard said, fine, I'll let you in. But I'm warning you, if I find you praying, if I find you praying, <laughs> anyway, so that's the joke. <laughs> so be it as it may, here we are in the Gemara. Okay, great, wonderful. So every day, Hillel would actually go to work. Half the salary he would give to his family, right? Half the salary he would pay, half the salary pay for the guard. One day, uh, he, couldn't find, he couldn't find work. One day he couldn't find work. And since he couldn't go find work, the guard wouldn't let him in. So what did he do? We all know the story. Come on, you all know the story, right? What did he do? Excellent, there you go. So what did he do? It says there that he went into, it, it, it was a sunroof, right? I guess it was a nice space manager. It was a sunroof, and, right? Right? That Shmaya of Italian was like the first Bezden in the, first Av uh, Bezden in the first Nazi. Fine, that day it was Erev Shabbos, and it was Tavis. When's Tavis? The dead of winter. Right? And sure enough, it started snowing. So basically, like they used to learn it on Friday night. They used to actually have base medish. They used to learn a lot on Friday night. And the next morning, whenever it comes to shul, they say, wow, it's particularly dark in here. How come the sun is not coming in? And sure enough, Shmaya said to Aftalian, what's going on? Why is, why, why is there no sunlight? They looked up and they saw the body of Hillel, right? Blade on the spread out on the uh, sunroof. Fine. 
and they found on him a, they went up there quickly, they found on him a whole entire heap of snow. Fine, they took him down, they washed him, they massaged him, and they put him next to a fire. This guy, it's worthwhile to Mechal Shabbat for. That's the Gemara. And the Gemara says, so, Nebuch, our uh, pauper who goes up to Shemayim a couple thousand years later, and God's going to say, why did you learn? And he'll say, well, I said, what do you want? I had no time. I had to bring up Parnassah. He'll say, oh, look at Hillel. Look, you are important than him. And he managed to learn. No matter, you're right, he managed to learn, right? And then the Gemara goes to the famous story of the rich man. You all know the Gemara. The rich man didn't come up to heaven and say, I couldn't learn. I'm so rich. What do you want for my life? I'm running an empire. Then they bring a certain Rebbe Laza. We have a Rebbe, Rebbe Laza has like a thousand, a thousand cities, a thousand, uh, tens of thousands of servants. And he basically would learn all day and all night. So you, you weren't richer than him. And then the Gemara says, Yo, you're, you're so handsome? The next guy comes and says, oh, I'm so handsome. What do you want for my life? You know, <laughs> you know I had to comb my hair all day. So the, the Gemara says, oh, you are more handsome than Yosef. And he seemed to have been, a, he seemed to have not thrown, thrown out his, his religion, his religiosity. That's the Gemara, right? My father-in-law always quotes this Gemara because my father-in-law has a terrible, terrible voice. Right? Rosh Shiva has many, many good qualities, but one of them is not his voice. Right? Which is funny because his family are all very musical. His whole family is all musical. His, his father wrote popular music. That was his Parnassus. He, he wrote music and he was a musician, but he had a terrible voice. And whenever we had guests, so he would start, a lot of times the guests wouldn't sing. They, they were shy. My father would say, I'm gonna, why aren't you singing? Why aren't you singing? The guy would say, oh, I don't know how to sing that well. I have a bad voice. My father would say, worse than me, you're not. Worse than me, you're not. Because he really had a terrible voice. A terrible voice. So if I could sing, you could sing. My father said if he would put an addendum into the Gemara, he would answer, there are, as another person. Not the Schiller, it's Mikhaev, all the people who don't sing because they think they have bad voices. No, you see, if not the Schiller could sing even though he has a bad voice, you also. It doesn't make a difference how bad voices, you got to sing Shabbos and Mirrors. Anyway, anyway, I actually remember when I was in Chaim Berlin, when I was in Chaim Berlin, they just uh, built a new building, and in my shear room they had a sunroof. And we were 17 years old, uh, and it was, it was one day it was snowing. And me and my friends did a, did a prank. I mean, now I think about it, it's a little ridiculous, but what we did was, we actually, I remember I took my mother's, you know, you know the Haredi ladies, they wear those wigs? Where do, you put, where do you put those wigs when you're not wearing them? You have like a head, like a doll head. So we basically took that doll head and we constructed a whole entire body of a person, and we put it on the sunroof of the, of the, of the uh, uh, shear room, and it was snowing, and we were basically uh, portraying the story of the hill. My Rebbe did not appreciate the joke. Everyone else in the sh shir did. This is what Haredi people do. This is, what, this is how we get our kicks. This is how we get our hijinks, right? That was my big escapade. And it appears to me, we are uh, digressing. So it appears to me. So uh, what do we see? Why am I quoting this Gemara? Because listen to the language. Listen to the language of the Gemara. The Gemara says like this. After they uh, rescued Hillel, Ask the rescue hill, Shmaiva Italian said, listen to Lashin, Royu Ze Lechalal Olav a Shabbat. This person, it is fit that we Michal the Shabbat for him. Because they took him down. He had, uh, you know, he was freezing. They, 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 they warmed him up. They made a fire, right? So they said, oh, this person, it's, it's right to Michal the Shabbat. So Rabbi Reicher asked, this is Rabbi Reicher, the famous Rabbi Reicher. The Ian Yaakov, the Swiss Yaakov says, wait one minute. What do you mean? This person, it is fit to Michal Shabbos. You, you Michal Shabbos every person. It's not a single person you don't Michal Shabbos for. Right? So what in the world is the Gemara talking about? This person, it is right to Michal Shabbos. Says Rabbi Reicher. Uh, says Rabbi Reicher, it's a right to the Michal Shabbos. It's a right to the Michal Shabbos. He doesn't quote the Michal Shabbos. But no, it's not true. Any other person who, for whatever crazy reason, would decide to camp out outside in the snow on Shabbos, you wouldn't have to save him. You wouldn't have to save him, like the Mechachinach. What did Mechachinach say? You try to commit suicide, or you're totally negligent about your body. That's it. We don't got to save you. Loisam and Adam Recha doesn't apply to such a person, just like by Hashem with the Veda. Right? So, the truth is, uh, you don't have to save a person who was totally negligent. A person who 
decides to go swimming in a shark infested area with jaws and everything and without a life, a, a life jacket, you don't got to save the guy, according to the Mitzvah Gereisha. So why did they say, why did they save Hill? Seemingly he was so negligent. So that's what it says, Roy Allah Hillel, Hillel sought that since he was doing a mitzvah, shame and mitzvah la yedara. There's a concept that when you do a mitzvah, you get protected. So Hillel, obviously mistakenly, maybe not so mistakenly because he didn't die at the end, but be it the main, Hillel felt for him it was mutter to take a risk. Meaning Hillel was not negligent about his life. So therefore, the Gemara is bringing out that point. Only Hillel it was worthwhile to save because he actually did not, uh, did, w- w- was not forfeiting his life or being negligent. He thought that he would be safe. But anyone else, anyone else who would do a prank like Hillel, basically just sleep outside for no reason, you know, he wants to show how much he, how, how he can endure the cold or something crazy like that, you wouldn't have to save. So here we have an open raya, it's a very strong raya to the Mechaz and the, uh, that's our righteous raya. Oh. By the way, I, I, didn't, I never heard this. Maybe you guys never heard this. When Rabbi Reich explains this Gemara, it says Hillel couldn't find a job. And it was Friday. And it was Tavis. Meaning, so Gemara would say it was a really cold day. So what, what do they got to do that it was Friday? Right? So you could say that, could one say that they found him the next day on Shabbos, and the Mechal Shabbos. But he brings down that on Friday is always it's the coldest day of the week. You ever heard that? And it brings a riot from this week's Parsha. This week's Parsha. This week's Parsha brings a riot. There's a riot. And this week's Parsha is that Friday is the coldest day of the week. It says, Kar Kar Kol B'nei Sheth. That's one of the, in the Nevoah Bilam, it says Kar Kar Kol B'nei Sheth. Literally means that, that Mashiach will have dominion over the whole world. Sheth is the, the only surviving child of Adam Rishon, right? So the little tantrum is kar kar kol b'nei sheith. But he says, you could read it as a hint in kar kar. What does kar mean in Hebrew? Cold. Kol b'nei sheith. What is sheith? The sixth day. The, the rem is in this week's parasha that on Friday it's always the coldest day of the week. I just, I, I just like to know if that's scientifically true. If there's, if there's some validity to that. But that's what he says. Kar kar kol b'nei sheith, which is this week's parasha, shows that Friday is the coldest day of the week. So anyway, you never heard that, did you? Me either. That's what that's fascinating. Me either, mate. So we have here a raya to the Mitzvah Chinuch and to um, and from Rabbi Reicher. Listen, is it the greatest raya in the world? Obviously, it's not the greatest raya. It's a first of all, I got it to Gemara. So I got it to Gemara. So it's not the greatest raya. The the chido it is a pretty good raya. It is a pretty funny thing that the Gemara says. Oh, this one is fit to save. It is a little, it's a little funny. You know, you save everyone. It is a little bit of raya. Some say. The chido, which I don't think is a great answer. It just means sometimes, you know what happens? You save someone's life on Shabbos, right? And afterwards, that guy becomes a total Russia. He's a mumer lahachis, and he does terrible things. So like, you're looking at, you know what? I really, I really wish I didn't save that guy. You know, that was a, that was a bad move. Now, the truth is, the strict halacha, we don't pass them, the strict halacha is you don't save a mumer lahachis. A mumer lahachis is someone who is uh, not from, he willfully, he doesn't believe in God or he doesn't care about God. So strict halach is you're not Mechal Shabbat for such a person. Now, in our days, Mechal Shabbat for everyone and everything, but all different types of reasons. It doesn't apply, right? It doesn't apply in our days. Maybe I'll give a share of that one day. Why not? So, a little bit you can hear. They were saying, wow, on Hillel, it was for sure good investment. Someone else, maybe... You know, maybe retroactively we'll find out that it wasn't such a good investment because it, that's what the Chidol wants to learn this Gemara. But it's not such a great answer. Raisha's dick is a, is a pretty good dick, like the Mechit Chinuch. But here's the main. This is a riot. That if you're to the Mechit if you're negligent on your body, no one has to save you. Fine. Uh, the truth is, the Iyun Yaakov is Lishi Tosoy. The Iyun Yaakov, which is the same Rabbi Raisha, uh, has a story. This is actually a story brought down in the Shulchan Aruch. The, 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 let's say you get, you're, you're Shabbos, right? You're at Shabbos. And all of a sudden, someone comes to you. You won't believe it. Your daughter is being abducted by missionaries, right? Jews for Yashka. They, they got your daughter. You're like, 
yeah, and they're going to take her to some monastery and turn her into a nun. And you're like, oh my gosh, it's Shabbos, what do you do? Get into your car and you got to save your daughter. You got to get away from those, you got to get, 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 get away from the missionaries. What's the law? Again, no bodily, there was no sakana to the daughter. That's not the issue at all. She was not going to get killed. Right? Not going to get killed. No one's going to get killed over here. So you'll say, oh, I don't know. I'm a Shabbos. So the truth is, it's an open halacha. The Rishonim talk about this. And the Rishonim say openly, you go and Mechal Shabbos to get your daughter. Not to be abducted, to become a, uh, a, a, a nun. Or, or to become a pasty. Right? Right? Mechal Shabbos, whatever has to be done to get your daughter from being, uh, from turning into a, a, a Christian. And they talk about all different. You actually saw these Gemaras. You actually don't realize it, but we, we learned the Gemaras being inside to talk about the stuff. But basically they say, well, if you're Mechal Shabbos to save someone's body, definitely you're Mechal Shabbos to save someone's soul. They bring all different types of Gemaras that you do a small Avera in order to make sure to, in order to uh, save someone from doing big, big Averas. And over here, if she becomes a, if she becomes a nun, that's like a terrible Avera, by Zara, whatever. Okay, that's, the, this is this open Shulchan Aruch. Oh, the, now, the case that is being discussed in the Beis Yosef is where the daughter is being abduct, abducted against her will, right? The Nachla Shiva, the famous Nachla Shiva, uh, says, even if the daughter or son is going willfully, Let's say you have a young kid, a teenager, right? A teenager, 14 year old kid, and you find out, somehow or other you find out your kid is becoming a pasty. 14, 15 year old kid, a young kid. Yeah, that's it, he found the light, he found the, he found the issue over there, oh yeah, he's going. Now you know, if you uh, get him and you give him a good spanking, you know, and you put him in a room somewhere in a couple days, he won't be able to go. You, basically, you still have control over him. So you know he's about to elope with, uh, with Virgin Mary over there. You know he's about to run away, you know? And you're like, oh my gosh! So what about in that case? So you say the same thing. Not the same thing. Michal Shabbos, get into your car, get that 14-year-old kid, stuff chomp down his mouth on Shabbos, and put him in a closet, you know? We'll take care of him, make sure that he doesn't, he becomes a nice yeshiva buffer. That's what Nachal Shabbos says. And, and he says, Nachal Shabbos says, oh, baby, it's different. The classic case is talking where the son and daughter is abducted against their will. The, only, the, the, the original case that the Beit Yosef talks about is where they were abducted, the daughter and son abducted against their will. So how are you, so says Nakh Shiva, how should I know to extend it where they're actually doing it willfully, or doing it, doing it purposely? Maybe if the kid was doing it purposely, that's it, you know, he's doing it purposely. You give him a Chal Shabbos to save someone who's going to pass it purposely. So the Nachal Shabbos says no. He says no. He says, just like if someone's trying to commit suicide on Shabbos, certainly you're going to save him, even though he's doing it on purpose. And he says, moreover, moreover, every sick person, this is something amazing, every sick person, it's his fault that he's sick. He did it to himself. Because if you didn't do sins, God would have made you sick. See, even if you're just a sick person, you have a flu, whatever, you have some uh, 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 life threatening disease, it, it's your fault. It's always your fault. You did it to yourself. Because if you are a good guy, you would never die. So he said, it's always the guy's fault. And you see that the law is in Machal Shabbos to save a suicide victim, a suicide attempt at suicide, and you save Shabbos for any sick person. So who cares? So the apostate over here, the kid, is doing it on purpose. So what? We see that doing it on purpose makes no difference. And that's what the Nachash of Paskins, you're in shul, you hear your son is going to run away with the Jesuits, he's running away, even though the kid's doing it on purpose, you run, Michal Shabbos, to stop the kid. Obviously, if you can't stop the kid, it's a waste of time, you know. And nowadays, probably, wait. maybe in the good old days, they had more control over the kids, fine. On this, the Shus Yaakov and the E Yaakov goes ballistic. He says, not true. And that's why we pass like this, by the way. Not true. If the kid is doing it on purpose, you do not mechal Shabbos save him. If the kid says, I want to become a Christian or a Muslim, they're talking about actually uh, by Muslims over there. It makes no difference. Then you do not save him. You do not mechal Shabbos save him. The only time is if the big kid's being abducted. And says the, the Shavuz Yaakov, this that you said, Shiva, that you save a person who's trying to commit suicide, it's not true. You don't save a person who's trying to commit suicide. 
definitely not to Michal Shabbos. You don't try to say definitely not to Michal Shabbos. Definitely not. So it's not true. And this that you said, every sick person is to blame. Here's a Ian Yaakov says, what type of comparison is that? Yeah, maybe the sick person missed Meyer a couple years ago and that's why he's sick now. Maybe. But that doesn't mean he wanted to die. That doesn't mean that he was he wanted to neglect his body. That doesn't mean that he was didn't care about his body or soul. How can you say every sick person is comparable to the guy, the apostate, who now wants to become a mummer? The apostate who wants to become Christian. The apostate who wants to become an Islam. Uh, he wants to become a Muslim. How can you compare the two? Yes, if you're trying to commit suicide, we see you don't care about your body. If you're totally negligent and you store yourself in the water with sharks and you don't, oh, fine. You're totally negligent, you're totally crazy, you sleep outside in the snow for 10 days, fine. Uh, if you're trying to purposely run away with the Christian, fine. But to say that someone who's sick, oh, it's your fault, you did it to yourself because you did a sin a couple years ago, you know, you couldn't control yourself and you ate a cheeseburger or something. That, that's cool that you want to die. That's cool that you don't care about your body. That's cool that you don't care about the uh, about yourself. So therefore, the Shlus Yaakov Lishi Tosai, Lishi Tosai, like the Mishnah Chinuch says quite emphatically, if you're trying to commit suicide, you don't save the guy. You're trying to become an apostate. You want that you want? Go ahead, become an apostate. We can't do anything about it. Okay. So now, so let's go to a. Um, Another Gemara that would seemingly be a raya for for the Mechachinach, for the Zayda. But the Gemara talks about like this a crazy case. I mean, he, a guy, a, a rich guy, rich, 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 and he's starving to death. Why is he starving to death? He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to, he's so cheap, like, he's so cheap, he doesn't want to spend his own money on food. So he has this guy basically doing a. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a, he's starving himself, right? He's starving himself, and even though he's very rich, because he doesn't eat his own food, right? So what do you do? What do you do with such a guy? So the Gemara, one man number says, oh, you know what? Feed him, and when he dies, he'll take all the money back from his uh, inheritance, right? Okay. The, the halach is, don't do anything. Let the guy die. Let the guy die. Let the guy die. He doesn't want to eat, let the guy die. Now, I don't, again, uh, as an aside, it seems to me the guy's a total nutcase and he's not mentally sane. So, it must be the Gemara knows we're talking about a person who is normal and every other aspect of his life he's totally normal. And just in this one area, he's like McScrooge over there. Just in one area, he's, just in one area, he, he, he doesn't want to eat his food, right? I mean, I presume in 99% of the cases, this guy's crazy. I mean, we do find nowadays that their prisoners are going on uh, hunger strikes and stuff like that. But this, right? You do find such a thing. It's amazing, and they die. It's amazing. They actually die. Uh, it just happened just, just recently. An Arab, uh, a terrorist went on a hundred strike and died. Now, be it as it may, it must be talking about that the guy is normal. So what's that? Lacha? Lacha, you're right. It's an open riot. That if a guy wants to commit suicide, you don't got to do anything. You don't got to try to save him. Because a gvir is a zillionaire, but he doesn't want to eat. Okay, you don't want to. We don't got to do anything to help you. But sir, it's a very strong right to the That if you try to commit suicide or you're just totally negligent about your life, uh, we don't got to save you. Oh, so but it's not the it, it's it's not the it's not a hundred percent right. There's a little, there's a slight difference over here. The Mikhinich, we're talking about a case where a guy tried to commit suicide or a guy put himself in a totally negligent situation, right? And then he's now in, he can't save himself anymore. He can't actually save himself anymore. He put himself in a situation like Hillel's situation. It came to a certain point that that's it. If someone didn't save Hillel, he would have died. You know, someone's committing suicide, it comes to a certain point, if someone else doesn't save them, he'll die. So in the, there the Mishnah says the big Hiddish, even in that case, they don't got to save him. But in this case, everyone would agree. Because in this case, the rich man is not in a dangerous situation. He's never in a dangerous situation. It's a facade. He's not in a dangerous situation. It's like, uh, 
You walk into a room and the guy says, help me, I'm drowning. Well, you're drowning, there's no water here. No, please, I'm dying, I'm drowning. You gotta save the guy? No, he's not, he, he, right? The answer to the rich guy is not in danger. He could just take food. So that's why you don't gotta save him. Because you don't gotta save someone who's not in danger. The cases that we're talking about is when the guy's actually in danger. When the act, guy's actually in danger and, and there's no quick way out of it, right? So that would be a, that would be a, 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 a chilek, maybe. Again, it's not, the rye is a little bit better than the, than, than the chilek. So, so oh, we could bring another proof uh, to, to the Mikhil Chinuch that again, you don't have to save someone who's trying to commit suicide, or it's totally negligent, what would be the other proof? From the Gemara in Sanhedrin. What's the famous Gemara in Sanhedrin? The Gemara in Sanhedrin is talking, a famous Gemara, you learn Yeshiva. We all know something called the Baba Machteris, right? We know that the Baba Machteris, it's a Pasuk in the Chumash, someone is tunneling into your house, you're allowed to kill him. Anyone's allowed to kill him. He's called a rodei. Why? Because we say anyone is tunneling into your house, making such an effort, he'll definitely try to kill you. If, he, if that's what it comes to, he'll try to kill the house owner. So he basically is not only a robber, he's also basically called a uh, murderer. So you're allowed to kill him. You're allowed to kill him. Fine. And the guard says, depends. If the Ganev is a relative, like a father tunneling into a son's house, then you can't kill him. There's no way a father would kill a son. There's no way that that Ganev is actually also a murderer. But if it's anyone else, we say basically every uh, Ganev that's tunneling into your house is really a murderer. He'll murder you. Okay, fine, great, that's the law. So there you are, you wake up at night, you see your, uh, someone tunneling into your house, you take out your shotgun, Right? No problem. Kill him. Right? No. Let's say the guy is tunneling in your house and, and anyone can kill him. Anyone can kill him. Anyone. Not only the owner. Any person can kill the uh, guy tunneling into the house because he's basically a murderer. Let's say the guy already stole and now you see him three days later walking on the street. You can't kill the guy. You can't kill the robber because he's not a murderer anymore. He was only considered a potential murderer when he was in the house because of the situation that he'll probably kill the Baal Bayez if he has to, so he gets the, uh, he gets the appellation, become, he's called a, a murderer. But obviously, after the story comes into effect, after the story is finished, he's not called a murderer anymore. So you can't kill the guy two days later. No one can kill him. Not the Baal Bayez, not, the, not the, uh, anyone out in the street, fine. Okay, great, great. Now, the story is like this. The Gemara says open like this. That if the murderer, the, the, the uh, Ganev, the guy who's tunneling, the tunneling, the, 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 the guy who's tunneling, the Ganev who's also the murderer, while he's in the tunnel, the, the tunnel implodes on him. It implodes on him. So he's been, inca that's it. His career has Ganev and, his career has Ganev and potential murderer is over. But it's Shabbos. Do you try to save that do Michal Shabbos try to save that guy? Do you try to save? So here, see, a guy's tunneling into the, under your house. Uh, everything imploded, the cave fell in. It's over with. There's no way he's gonna be murdering anyone anymore. There's no way he's gonna steal anyone anymore. Do you try to save him uh, on Shabbos? You'll have to do Malach Shabbos. You have to take out an electric, uh, uh, what do you call it? The electric um, hammer, try to get him out, right? Whatever it may be. So the Gemara says, according to Rashi, don't save him. Don't save him. And everyone is trying to figure out why not. Why don't you save the guy? He's not. That's clear like day that once he left the tunnel, you sure you would save him if something happened to him on Chavez. He's only considered a road diff only when there's a, he, he's, 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 he's endangering other people. But the second that he's been incapacitated, he's not a road diff anymore. He's like a regular guy. So example, that's clear like day. A guy telling in a house on Shabbos, and then a couple of hours later, it's by Shal Shudah's time, he starts choking uh, uh, on, on the gefilte fish or whatever. Of course he saved him. Aye, he has a history that he was a relative. 
Yeah, th- only then you're allowed to kill him because only then he was uh, he was dangerous. But once he leaves that house, of course he's Michal Shabbos saves him. So why in the world aren't you Michal Shabbos to save this guy? Why not Michal Shabbos to save this guy? He's not a Rodif anymore. He's not a Ganav anymore. Oh, so everyone, everyone and his Chavrusa is trying to figure out this Gemara. It's like a famous a conundrum, like one of the big problems in this oh. So the Ar, the the uh, Ar Godel, who's Ar Godel? The Godel Miminsk, right? The famous genius. Says, oh, I'll tell you what the Pshat Gemara is. The Pshat Gemara is like the Mechaz Chinech. The Pshat Gemara is like the Ian Yaakov. Now what? Let's analyze this guy. When this guy is in the tunnel, when he's in that situation, does, does he care about his life? Does he, is he someone who is negligent or not? Well, clearly he's someone who's negligent because he's, he's exposing himself to be killed. Because what's the law? Someone's tunneling into a tunnel. You can kill him. Anyone can kill him. Baal Bayez, the maid, next door neighbor, anyone can kill him. So if we had to, that, that minute, that second, right before the cave implodes on him, right? The tunnel implodes on him. He is someone who doesn't care about his life. He is someone who is totally negligent about his life. Because he's willing to take these crazy risks. He's like someone who just goes swimming in the middle of a, of a shark-infested uh, ocean. He's like someone who just decides to sleep outside in the snow. So, says our Godel, based on the Minchah's Chinuch, the Gemara makes sense. You don't got to save this guy. He doesn't care about his own life at that time. At that time, he doesn't care about his own life. So what do we learn when Minchah's Chinuch holds? Someone doesn't care about his own life. You don't got to save him. He owns his body, right? So this is a proof that's why you don't have to save, it's called Mafakim of a Gal. You don't gotta release him from the Gal, from the heap of stones, even though technically he's not dangerous anymore. Because he has testified or given testimony by his action that he doesn't care about his life. Okay? That's what the Aragad will learn. So another ride to the Mikhail oh. But the truth is, other there are other ways to learn this tomorrow. But no. Mechachinech is not right. The Aragadol is not right. So what's the plan of Why don't you save this guy? He's not dangerous anymore. He's not dangerous anymore. Oh. They say, well, let's see. Be- a second before, a second before the, the, the cave imploded. Right, now, now he's not dangerous. But a second before, what should every good citizen do? Kill the guy. Everyone should have killed him. The owner should have killed him. The neighbor should have killed him. That's what should have been. So we say, God killed him. If what should have happened a second before is that someone should have shot him. That should have been. This guy tunneling in the tunnel should have been killed. Yes, a second later, when the, when the, when the tunnel implodes on him, no one's allowed to kill him, no one's allowed to touch him, uh, because now he's not dangerous anymore. But can you not see in your mind that, oh, he was supposed to be killed by by uh, the neighbor, by you, by the owner. So why can't we say it must have been that God killed him? Because he was supposed to get killed. So it's a clear indication that God wants him dead. Now we don't always say someone who's sick or someone who uh, had an accident or someone who uh, even tried to kill himself. We don't say it's an indication God wants him dead. But here, since the halach is that you're supposed to kill him at that point in time, the halach was, when the cave fell on him, that second the cave fell on him, he, you were supposed to kill him. So here we say it is an indication that God wants him dead. All right, so why did, he kill, why did God kill him instantaneously? Maybe he wants to have a slow death because obviously he's still alive because we're talking about trying to save him. No. Basically we're saying when something happens to a Gavra Katila, when something happens to someone who is supposed to die, even though subsequently he's not supposed to die, but if something happens when he's supposed to die, that's the revelation that God got involved. And once God got involved, keep out of it. Right? It's a little bit of a... <laughs> a little bit of a... Esoteric type of shot. Or... Spiritual type of shot. But the best shot is the Miri. The Miri says... The Gemara means over here like this. The Miri says, you know what? The truth is you're right. If the guy's a robber and a rodif, and once the... Uh, and the cave implodes on him. If you know for sure he's alive, you gotta save him. That's right. You gotta save him. Why? 
It's like we said, that's it. He's not dangerous anymore. Why not save him? You're only allowed to kill a, a Ganev who's a Rodev only when he's dangerous. The mere sense of Gemara means here you're not sure if he died. What's the law? Are you Mechal Shabbos for someone who you're not sure if he's alive or dead? Of course. Of course. Of course you're Mechal Shabbos for someone whether you a suffix if he's alive or dead. Right? Someone has lost at sea, you're Mechal Shabbos. Even though you don't know if he's alive or dead or not. Someone goes in a submarine and it implodes. Right? The people do that sometimes. And uh, you know what I'm referring to? Yeah, okay. So you of course the Mechal Shabbos for such a thing. Of course the Mechal Shabbos for such a thing. What's the question? Of course you have a Chal Shabbos for But here's the difference. Here's the difference. This guy, why? Because you say, Cheskiz Chaim. You say, listen, we know he's lied before. There's a good chance he's still lying. Mechal Shabbos. This Ganim, this Rodif, what happened? Right now he's not dangerous. He's not dangerous anymore. But we're talking here, you don't know if he's alive or dead. Here we say, probably he died. Because probably God don't like him. Since the second before he was supposed to die, and everyone's supposed to kill him, here we say, here we say, the probability is that he's actually dead. Why? Because he was supposed to be killed a second, a second ago. So we say probably God did a good job. God probably did a good job. So that, 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 in my mind, that's like the best shot. For the various reasons. That's the Miri's shot. That basically, the Gemara here is talking about where we don't know if he's alive or dead. Uh, hence, we could assume that he's dead because he had a death sentence on him a minute before. Okay? Peter the Bay, this is a very famous Gemara, very famous question. Peter the Bay, the Orha Godol brings a riot from this Gemara to the Mikhas Chinuch. And we're saying that it's not, it's not a 100% a riot because there are maybe other ways uh, to, uh, to work it out. Okay. So. I'm, I'm not, there are many Gemaras. I, I consider all day. There are many Gemaras that talk about this type of situation. Another famous Gemara is in Gemara in Gittin. The Gemara talks about uh, redeeming someone who gets uh, captured by a um, captured by uh, Goyim. The Gemara talks about someone actually selling himself to Goyim. The Gemara says that if someone sells himself to Goyim one or two times, you've got to redeem him. The third time, you don't redeem him anymore. But the Gemara says, if he sells himself to cannibals, Right? Then you redeem him no matter how many times he did it. Ahu Gavri Dzav Nafshe Liludoi. The guy sells himself to cannibals. Right? Right? Silence of the lamb, cannibals, you know what I'm talking about? So it's very bad. Very bad. So even if he did it ten times, you save him. You say, wait one wait one minute. That sounds not like the Mikhis I mean, is there anyone more suicidal than selling yourself to cannibals? I mean, what's the chance that you're going to survive, right? So, Lechari hears a riot against the Minchas Chinuch. That you save someone even though he's trying to kill himself. Oh, so, the Lechari the, the, the is on the Minchas Chinuch. And the Rabbi Reicher and the Minchas Chinuch on the other on one side. But there are actually a lot of Lechari on that side. You know, if someone was stopping you in the street and said, don't save a suicide victim, you'd think, what, are you crazy? Because the Lechari is not like the Minchas Chinuch. But there are actually a lot of Echoyim that, that say the Gemara Chinuch. That if you're negligent, you don't say the guy. Especially not the Mechal Shabbos. Especially not the Mechal Shabbos. There's a whole slew of life. So they say, no, if you look at the Gemara Zia, the Ron explains, it wasn't talking about that you actually sold yourself to uh, cannibals. It's a whole complicated Gemara there. But it's actually talking about, the Ron learns, it's you've defaulted. You borrowed money from a, uh, you borrowed money from a cannibal, and then you couldn't pay, so, and the cannibal then took you basically as payment. He said, you can't pay, I'll eat you instead. But it wasn't talking about that you actually originally sold yourself straight up to cannibals. That's not the situation. So again, it depends. It's complicated tomorrow. So be it as may. What do we do to here so far today? What do we do here so far today? We said that according to Mishkinah, you own your body. And since you own your body, you can kill yourself. Again, not Allah can kill yourself. But if you just try to kill yourself, someone doesn't have to save you. Doesn't have to save you. Just like if you throw away your wallet or don't care about your cow. Oh. And we saw, we saw, surprisingly enough, many riots that would seem to indicate that he's right. He tried to get out of them. Okay, now, what is the bottom line? The bottom line is, No matter what, you save someone, no matter what situation. No matter what. We know the Marami Rutenberg, who was the Marami Rutenberg, the Rebbe of the Rush, who he, who he himself was captured, famous Marami Rutenberg, he died in, uh, in prison. 
He lived uh, in the 1200s, basically. And he said, he says emphatic, he says he says right to black and white. You machal Shabbat for someone who's trying to kill himself. It doesn't make a difference. The Maram of Lublin, who's the Maram, Maram uh, from Lublin? That's the Maram in the back of the bar that we learned all day. Maram Lublin, right? That's the famous Maram, right? He was a, who was he friends with? The Masha, right? They were friends, they knew each other. Sure, they were friends, and, uh, and uh, the famous story was to get from Vienna. The famous story, the fights, whatever. So Maram Lublin, so he also brings a whole story, a whole tshuva. There was a Jewish guy who decided to have a girlfriend, an Arab girlfriend. And everyone knew that a Jewish guy would have an Arab girlfriend was endangering himself and the community because it was against the law. Some Jewish guy had an Arab girlfriend. No, 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 no. This, 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 forget the Vienna. There's a, there's a famous, there's a famous, I'll give a share one day about that, the get from Vienna. It was like, there was a certain get that was given that the whole world was arguing about. The Masha, the Panesh, everyone, everyone was arguing about a certain get. Because of whatever, whatever the story was. So be it in May, uh, the total digression. I do that sometimes. The Bidl and A, the Maram, was asked a question, should we try to save this kid? The kid's a, a, a Jewish boy had a girlfriend, they had problems, a Jewish girlfriend in the good old days. We're talking about 500 years ago. We're talking about 500 years ago. And that, the same question was that, should we try to save the kid? You know, he did to himself. Everyone knew that you know, you're you endangering yourself, the community. Do you try to save him? And Maram and the Bidl said the same thing. Save him. Doesn't make a difference. Doesn't make a difference that he's negligent. Doesn't make a difference that he was suicidal. It doesn't make a difference. You don't own your body. It doesn't make a difference of what you did to bring about the situation. The Birka Yosef, famous Birka Yosef, the Chida, right? The Chida, who was what? He was like, I don't know, it must have been a, like a super genius photographic memory, but he was a, was a fundraiser. So he would travel all around Europe and he would visit all the libraries and he had an amazing, uh, he, he had access to all different types of manuscripts and libraries. And he wrote like, I don't know, a zillion books. So one of his books, one of the most famous farm are, are the Birka Yaita, the Chida, the famous Chida. And he brings a story there. What the story was, there was a medicine man who used to write amulets, right? Amulets, amulets. It's an egg. Not the amulets that you eat the egg. Amulets, right? A kamea, a kamea, right? And people would ingest poison and he would write this, this something on, on this paper and it, they, would, they would stick it down the person who had the poison, uh, inject the poison, and the guy, and automatically all the poison, he would uh, regurgitate all the poison, spit out all the poison, right? Expectorate all the poison, everything would be spit out. Fine. What happened was, there was a girl who committed, who tried to commit suicide on Shabbos, and she ingested poison. And they ran to this uh, miracle worker. And he, on Shabbos, he wrote to Camille, and they stuffed it down the girl's uh, mouth. And sure enough, she threw up the poison and she was saved. And then there was a whole up uproar should they throw the me medicine man out of town. Why? Because it was Michal Shabbos. He was Michal Shabbos. He wrote a Kamiya on Shabbos. And the whole Chuvazir is dealing with supernatural medic uh, medicinal acts, supernatural uh, medication. Are you allowed to use that on Shabbos? Are you the Michal Shabbos? and to rely on supernatural medicine, right? So that was, that's what happened over here. The miracle man said, I know it works. I know it's not natural medicine or con it's not conventional medicine, but I know it works. So I was to save the to save the girl. Uh, but the other rabbi said, no, no, you can't rely. You can't be Michal Shabbos based, based on that you're going to do some type of magic, magic medicine. So he brings down to the Birka Yosef, um, that's actually my flight is for Shainim. Rambam, obviously with Paskin, you don't Michal Shabbos for supernatural medicine. Other Rishonim say you do Michal Shabbos. Again, we're talking, about, we're talking about, when we're talking about supernatural medicine, we're talking about something that actually works. We know that it worked a couple times. You know, obviously if uh, someone's uh, uh, doing Michal, if someone's dying on Shabbos and you're gonna, I don't know, you're gonna, you're, I don't know what you're gonna do, you're gonna do something crazy. You know, you're gonna take a bird and uh, rip it up or something. And, and it, we never saw that that, that, that worked. Obviously, not Michal Shabbos for that. We're talking about a supernatural uh, medicine, like riding an amulet. But actually, it worked a couple times. That was the situation there. The question is, could you be Michal Shabbos? So a whole Birka Yosef. But, but one thing we could... Maybe I'll revisit that Birka Yosef. There's many other aspects. But one thing we see from that Birka Yosef, he never said, wait a minute, she's committing suicide. What do you... You can't Michal Shabbos no matter what. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't the point of his conversation. 
we see from the his whole point of the conversation was how what medicine you were using to Michal Shabbos, right? So, so again, from the Birkei Yosef, we see clearly also that you allow to Michal Shabbos and you try to save someone who is, co is committing suicide, clear like day. That's what the Chemda says, that's what Rabbi Yosef Feinstein says. Oh, that's what Rabbi Yosef says. But Rabbi Shleim Eger, who's Rabbi Shleim Eger? Rabbi Kiva Eger's son, right? There's, people don't know about him, but he's, uh, I mean, you should know about him. It's the Gillian, uh, Gillian Masha. And who was Reb Shlom Eger's grandson? Who was Reb Shlom Eger's son? Reb Label Eger. Reb Label Eger was the uh, Admor. He became a Khadija Rebbe in Lublin. Reb Sadiq took over after him, right? His father sat Shiva on him because he wasn't too happy that, uh, that he became a Khadijish. Right? The same, uh, there's still Eger's in Bnei Brak that are Rebbe's now. There are Eger's that are Rebbe's now. Uh, so be it as may. Reb Shlom Eger actually passed on to Mechinach. So it's not, uh, it's not so uh, clear over here. Oh, the bottom. Oh my God. How, how are we going? Well, the bottom line is, I'll say two more things. And since Eliezer brings a raya from the Shulchan Aruch like what we passed it. Like we passed it. Why? Because the luck is like this. Let's say uh, a bunch of bandits come onto a town and they say, it's Shabbos. We say, town, we don't want to hurt you. We don't want to kill you. We just want your money. So the luck is, Fight them, Michal Shabbos, to stop them. And the question is, why? Why are Michal Shabbos to stop them? Well, what's your issue? They made, they, 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 these bandits have a track record even. They only want money. They don't want to kill anyone. So let them come in, take your money. Why are you Michal Shabbos? You're not Michal Shabbos uh, to save your money. So the Mughal Rav says, you're right. In principle, you should not be Michal Shabbos. You should not be Michal Shabbos. No. Nope. Why are you Michal Shabbos? Let them take your money. We're just afraid that there's one guy in the town who may illegally try to fight the bandits. There's the one guy in town who's going to be, oh, I can't let them have my money. There's always a guy like that. There's always a guy like that. But no, I, I can't. I can't let them have my money. I got I to do something. So that one guy in town is going to fight, and we're afraid that one guy is going to get killed. So therefore, because that one guy who is negligent and not acting properly, and is basically endangering his life for not a good enough reason, we, the, everyone fights against the bandits. So what do you see from the other That you basically are Michal Shabbos, and you try to save someone, even though he is the cause of his endangerment. He is the cause of the problem. Right? He is the cause of the problem. So, like I said, the halacha l'mais is, we haven't even started yet, my friends, but the halacha l'mais is like this. You're a Hatzalah guy. You're a Hatzalah guy. You get a call. Go to Avenue A, save a suicide victim. Again, again, this is all very abstract and theoretical. Because, again, it could be the suicide victim is a case of where it's not their fault. It's all very theoretical. That's why most of this conversation is only theoretical. Because most of the time you'll probably say, oh, he was a suicide victim who had a chemical imbalance and it's not his fault. It's very academic, this, this, this whole entire conversation. But be with me. You get a call. Uh, su uh, a suicide victim on Avenue A, yeah, he's a totally normal guy. He just lost all his money, so he's a little bit depressed about it. Yeah. And you get a good... Avenue Z, someone's drowning, not his fault, not at all. Since it's a machloik is... Well, we, we do paskin, you save everyone. But since we know a lot of places say don't go, you don't have to go to Avenue A, so if you're a solid guy, and you get a choice between A and Z, you go to Avenue Z. Because the guy in Avenue Z, everyone knows you have to save him, Michal Shabbos. Because it wasn't his fault at all. Totally not his fault. The guy had a heart attack. Nothing to do with it. Not his fault at all. The guy in the avenue A is questionable. Michal Chinech, the Ian Yaakov, the Rishlam Eger, and a slew of other Akhredim say, you don't got to save him. Don't be Michal Shabbos. The Or HaGadol, a lot of people say, don't save him, because he did it to himself. So, even though we don't pass him like that, but if you have a choice, and you only could save one, you go to the avenue Z. Okay, everybody, side, we're going to stop over here. We did most of what we wanted to do today. We'll stop over here. Emily Nether... We'll continue this next week, actually.